G'day YouTubers, and welcome to the second episode in the Northern Morton Bay series. This episode is going to be a bit of a mixed bag. I'll start off talking about Sharks Bit and the fishing opportunities around there, but then I'm going to concentrate on the things to do going further north up to Tangaluma, talk about the area itself, the anchorages, and some of the history around Morton Island and Tangaluma in particular. If all you're interested in is the fishing stuff, then after Shark Spit, you're out of luck. If you'd like to know about the anchorages, keep watching for a while. If you get to the history and you're not interested in that, you can shut down because it's pretty much history from then on. I hope you enjoy it. Let's roll. The last episode in this series we finished at the Sand Hills, so moving north from there, the next place I want to speak about is Shark Spit. This is the Navionics map of Shark Spit. Just doing the zoomed out section for a start, just to show you the unexploded ordnance area there. I mentioned the unexploded ordnance in the previous episode. What I didn't spell out, I did put it in the description and the comments, but I didn't say it in the video, is don't anchor there. Although the unexploded ordnance is going to be buried under layers of mud and sand by now, your anchor can dig deep into the mud and sand. So don't anchor there. Last thing you want is to pull up something that's hadn't exploded on the end of your anchor or trigger it while it's underwater. Best to be safe in these circumstances. As you can see from the map, Shark's Bit isn't all that far from the four beacons and it does protrude out into the area that's marked as unexploded ordnance. And I'll just note that there's not a bad anchorage just to the south of Shark's Bit. It's pretty shallow but a trailer boat will have no trouble in there. It's good from, say, north-northeast wind around to an east-southeast wind. And on that note, I'll just also mention that anywhere along the east coast of Morton can be an anchorage. It doesn't have to be marked as an anchorage or something that someone else uses. There's a lot of areas of beach that are quite secluded and have a reasonable approach so that it's deep enough to get in close to the shore. What you've got to do is just go in very slowly, uh, have your sounder on, keep an eye on the water, and if you can get into the beach, that's a good spot to stop. Now zooming in a little bit closer, you can see the beacon there that marks the spit. And if you're looking at this on a TV or a computer, you shouldn't have any trouble seeing the depth lines. But if you're on a phone, you may have to zoom in a little bit. As you can see though, the area shells down very quickly and gets quite deep. Those figures are in metres. This is another look at the satellite map. You can see the spit jutting out there from the island and as you can imagine as the tide plays in and out that area is going to hold a lot of bait fish and a lot of bait fish is going to attract the big fish. Now you could float a pilly out the back and probably catch some fish there. I've only ever trolled the area myself but we all know that mackerel will take floating pilly so there's no reason you can't catch them without trolling but my experience is in trolling and that's what I'm going to talk about here. The area that you see there, the rectangular area that I've marked, is roughly the area that I troll. Here's a couple of trips of trolling the area. You can see the track going through it. What I do is on my GPS I create a route with the four corners of that rectangle marked and then that gives me some lines as long as I stay inside those lines I'm trolling the area that I want to. You don't need to do that, you can just eyeball it, but I find it easier, particularly when I want to troll a particular feature, rather than try to keep track of it on the sounder and by eye, having the route on the GPS just makes it a lot easier. Now, by the route, I don't mean a route that you're going to follow on your autopilot, I just mean a route that shows up on the screen. You're not using it for anything other than as a marker to show you where something is. I generally don't use routes on my autopilot because I have a Raymarine autopilot and it has the annoying feature that you have to acknowledge every turn it makes before it will make it. So if you don't acknowledge a turn, it'll run you aground quite happily. For that reason, I don't use routes at all. And I guess you could say that's the other reason why I use them for this purpose. Uh, any route in my GPS is marking an area that I want to know the boundaries of. And that'll work with any GPS that you can put routes into. So if you don't already know about it, there's a trick you can use to mark an area. And the other thing about that is, 
where you have a point, a mark to go and fish, quite often your mark is in the centre of an area or somewhere within an area that holds a lot of fish. You don't have to be right on that mark, you just have to be in that area. And particularly if you're drifting, you need to drift through that area. So that's another thing you can do. You can use the route feature on your GPS to mark areas for fishing so that when you go and drift fish them, you just make sure you drift through that area rather than trying to get precisely over a mark. There are some areas where you have to be very precise on a mark, but in general, a lot of the areas, particularly offshore, they're patches, and as long as you're within the boundaries of that, you're going to get a fish. And this is the corner points of the rectangle that I use. If you're trolling that area, I troll it with uh, spoons behind planer boards. I have heard of fellas trolling it with hard body lures, uh, some deep divers, some shallow. They seem to do all right as well. I haven't had as much success with them as I have with planer boards. I generally catch mackerel in that area, either spotted or school mackerel. But I have heard of others catching more exotic species like wahoo, basically any pelagic fish. I guess I've heard of a variety of pelagic species being caught there. As I said, I haven't had any luck with anything other than mackerel, but by all means try your hard bodies and that, because that's what people have told me they've been catching the other pelagics on is hard bodies. So give them a go, you might get lucky. And just a final reminder, if you do decide to try your luck with floating a pilly out, make sure you don't drop your anchor in the unexploded ordnance area. And just moving a little bit further north along Morton Island, there's some anchorages just south of Tangaluma Point. They're pretty good in the right weather, not as good as getting behind the wrecks at Tangaluma, for various reasons I'll just explain, but the wrecks at Tangaluma get so crowded that you know, I just don't go in there anymore. These offer a reasonable alternative if the wind isn't too strong. There's a number of anchorages marked on the Navionics map along that area, but basically anywhere along that shoreline is fine. You don't have to be in one of the marked anchorage areas. It's all pretty much the same along there. There's a couple of sandbanks out from those areas and they will give you some protection from the wash of ships going up and down the shipping channel. They're not as good as the wrecks at Tangaluma for protecting you, but at low tide they're not too bad, they'll take the worst of it away. As for protection from the wind, well obviously the anchorages up to the north of that area are not going to be any good at all for wind from the north. As you go further south, you get a little bit of protection from winds from the north, but basically the whole area is good for winds from the northeast to the southeast. Anything further to the south or further to the north is going to get a little bit rocky in there. Still nice sand, good beaches in the right weather, great place to stop. And personally, I prefer it to Tangaluma because it's generally not as crowded. As for fishing in this area, I didn't do a lot of it. I did take the tender out a little bit and just, I think, whiting was mainly what I was looking for. It wasn't brilliant. There's certainly not as many whiting as there are further south in the Sand Hills, Blue Hole, that area. But I think I did manage to catch a few and provide the odd feed back on the big boat. So if you're in the area, a whiting rod by all means. I don't ever recall catching anything else there. Generally where there's whiting you'll find flathead, but I don't recall ever catching any. And the whiting were few and far between, so if you're there and you want to flick a line, by all means, but it's not somewhere I would go specifically to fish. Just north of Tangaluma Point is the Tangaluma Resort, and I expect everyone in Brisbane has heard of the Tangaluma Resort. They have a bit of a reputation among boaties of discouraging boaties from visiting the resort. Well, discouraging is probably not a strong enough word. They actually prohibit it. They have security guards patrolling to make sure that itinerant boaties don't go and use the resort facilities, or at least they used to. Since COVID's been around, I would have thought that the sensible thing to do would be to welcome anyone that had a dollar to spend into the resort. I don't know whether they have or not because I just don't go there. I have visited it once. I took my wife over on a whale watching tour. That was fine because she paid for the resort facilities as part of the tour. 
but I do know that bogies are basically turned away. Well, they were in the past, and since then I've never bothered going anywhere near it. But that's not to say there aren't other attractions there, and I have visited the area in my boats. It's quite a nice area. My only thing about it these days is that it's too crowded. Everyone goes there, and sometimes I've been there and there's barely room to swing a cat, let alone put a boat to swing on anchor. I do like to have a little bit of space between me and other boats when I anchor up, and a limited area behind the Tangalima wrecks just generally doesn't afford that. And unless you're in behind the wrecks, you will get a bit of a rock every time a ship goes past. The shoal bank does provide reasonable protection from the ship's wash at low tide, but if you want total protection from the ship's wash, you really do need to be in behind the wrecks. And if the wind has any sort of westerly components, then definitely need to be in behind the wrecks. Disregarding the anchorage area in behind the wrecks for a moment, there are some anchorage areas north and south of that. The ones to the north do provide better protection because you're in a little pocket in the sandbank. But the ones to the south aren't too bad either. You do have the shell bank to protect you a little bit from the wash from the ships passing by in the shipping channel. Depending on how frequently they come past, it might not bother you too much. I'll just mention that on the maps there's a couple of anchor berths marked. I assume they're for ships that are waiting to enter the Port of Brisbane, but I don't ever recall having seen ships anchored in those particular spots. One would expect that the wrecks at Tangaluma would attract a lot of fish, and the fishing there would be really fantastic. Well, if you thought that, you're half right. The wrecks are there and they do attract a lot of fish, but the fishing, in my experience, is just awful. Cannot get a fish to take a hook. You can go swimming there and snorkel down amongst them and they'll take food out of your hand, it just will not take a bait on a hook. I think the problem is that so many people are out there trying to fish them with baits on a hook that the fish to the left are getting pretty smart. But the counter argument is that if a fish is dumb enough to take a piece of plastic with a hook in it, they can't be all that bright. Snorkeling around the wrecks is pretty spectacular, and if you're into snorkeling, I'd recommend that highly. But if you don't have a wetsuit, I would advise jeans and a long sleeve shirt, because if you're swimming in close proximity to the wrecks, a little bit of a wave can wash you into them, and the shirt or jeans will give you at least some protection from getting scratches. On two occasions over the years, over at Tangalima, I have seen something that strikes me as funny. I never ever laugh at anyone who has any trouble on the water, particularly at a boat ramp. Accidents like that happen all the time. And I'd never laugh at anyone who had their boat high and dry on the water, except for what they did about it. I, I do apologise if any of these people are watching this video. I don't mean to offend you, but this was funny. These two boats that I saw in different times over the years were up on the sand. The tide had gone out and the edge of the water was just a little bit behind the boat. I guess they'd come in, gone for a walk on the beach and come back to find that the tide had gone out. One guy had him and his mates out there scooping sand with a bucket and their hands trying to dig a canal to the boat so they could float it back off and the other one had his wife and kids out there with their sand buckets and spades to him to try to do the same thing, dig a channel so they could float their boat or They had no hope at all of doing that. And just the fact that they were trying, I'm sorry, I, I find that just hilarious. If you're ever in that situation, the reality is all you can do is wait for the tide to come back in and float the boat off for you. If you're not comfortable getting around the bay at night time and navigating, best thing you can do is to go offshore, anchor up in deeper water, wait for morning, try and sleep, go home in the morning. Worst thing that can happen is you're going to lose a day's work and a day's pay. <laughs> but really, you're, you're wasting your time trying to get the family to dig you out. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear, sorry. That has, just tickles me every time I think about it. Now, I've talked about the anchorages at Tangaluma. I've talked about the abysmal fishing around the wrecks just because the fish won't take a bait and I've told you a funny story. Now I'm going to bore you with some history of the place because it's fascinating, or at least I think it is. I expect every one of you knows that Captain Cook was travelling up the east coast of Australia in 1770. 
But did you know that he named Cape Morton after the Scottish Earl of Morton, who was then the President of the Royal Society? He named Cape Morton on March 16th of that year. While we're on the subject of the Earl of Morton, I'll just point out that the Earl of Morton spelled his name M-O-R-T-O-N, and I'll come back to the significance of that shortly. But first of all, I just want to mention that Captain Cook also named Morton Bay, but he didn't name it Morton Bay. He named it Glasshouse Bay as a reference to the fact that the mouth of it was adjacent to the Glasshouse Mountains. I'll come back to the renaming of that again shortly as well. Around 1793, a fellow called Hawksworth transcribed Captain Cook's journals. He wasn't as conscientious as he could have been in that job because he spelled Morton M-O-R-E-T-O-N rather than M-O-R-T-O-N as Captain Cook had intended and as the Earl of Morton had spelled it. So ever since then, Morton Bay, Morton Island, Morton anything has been M-O-R-E-T-O-N, quite incorrectly. But nevertheless, it's stuck there now. Matthew Flinders arrived in Morton Bay on the 14th of July, 1799, and by the end of that month, he'd discovered that the body of land that Captain Cook had named Cape Morton, thinking that it was part of the mainland, was in fact an island. So in keeping with Captain Cook's theme, he named it Morton Island. The bay then became Morton Bay. Unfortunately, Flinders was working off the transcriptions that had been made of Captain Cook's journals, and he perpetuated the spelling of M-O-R-E-T-O-N. Pamphlet Parsons and Finnegan were three convicts who were shipwrecked, and they spent 21 days at sea before they eventually made land on Morton Island. Now, their story of survival and subsequent events is an extremely fascinating story, but I'm not going to go into it all at the moment because it's very long. Suffice to say that they eventually made it to the mainland and they were the first white men to set eyes on the Brisbane River. John Oxley found Pamphlet on one of his expeditions to the area and Pamphlet took John Oxley to the Brisbane River on the site of Brisbane today. An extremely fascinating story of survival. And just on a side note, the first settlement on Morton Bay was actually established at Redcliffe in 1824. It wasn't until later that the settlement was moved to the current site of Brisbane. Tangaluma is an Aboriginal word that means where the fish gather. And Tangaluma was originally established as a whaling station, which operated between 1952 and 1962. Back in the day, Tangaluma was the largest land-based whaling station in the entire Southern Hemisphere. During the peak of its operation, the whaling season lasted for 124 days and they employed a crew of 140 men who operated the station 24 hours a day to process 600 whales in each season. Everything from the whale was used. One whale could yield up to 8 metric tonnes of whale oil, which was the most valuable resource. That was used for making margarine, glycerine, cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, amongst other things back in the day. The meat itself was either cut up and sold for pet food or it was packaged and sent overseas for human consumption. The offal and other low-grade meats and the bones were processed into fertiliser, again, amongst other things. So nothing at all on the whale was actually wasted. In the mid-50s, vegetable oil was introduced into the market, and by 1959, that resulted in a massive drop in the price of whale oil. By 1961, the whales were getting scarcer and harder to find, so in August 1962, the whaling station ceased operation. During its 10 years of operation, it processed 6,277 humpback whales and one blue whale. I guess that blue whale was pretty unlucky. Back in the day, whale products were essential to keep our society and our economy running smoothly. There just weren't any alternatives. So I think it's quite wrong for the activists to point back to those days and say that it shouldn't have been done because there just wasn't an alternative. We needed those products. And that being said, we have alternatives now and I'm all for not whaling. I like the whales. They're beautiful creatures. I like to see them in the water when they migrate. I have seen them from time to time when I've been out fishing. I've caught them on the sounder going under the boat. There's no need to hunt them now that we have alternatives that are just as good or better. 
I just think it's rather stupid when people point to the past and say, well, they shouldn't have done it because the only alternative was to go without. And when have we ever as a society gone without when we had the means to provide? In June 1963, the whaling station was sold to a group of Gold Coast businessmen and eventually became the Tangalooma Wild Dolphin Resort. In 1980, it was sold to a Brisbane family and it's now just known as the Tangalooma Resort. The wrecks themselves were scuttled between roughly 1960 and 1980 there. And that's just a quick brief history of the Tangalooma area. There's a lot more to it. It's all very interesting. But I'll leave you to research it. Google's always your friend. Well, that's it for this episode. I do hope you enjoyed it. In the next episode, I'm going to cover a couple of wrecks, the Captain Nielsen and the Ammo Barge, and then I'll work my way north from Tangalooma up towards Combiore Point. I won't make it all the way because there's a lot of history involved in that, as well as fishing spots, etc. If you'd like to see some more of my videos in the meantime, you can go to my YouTube channel. Don't forget to click that like button, comment and subscribe for more. Until next time, good fishing.